Your CISO may be running security, but should they be making all the security decisions for the business? You're listening to Defense in Depth. Welcome to Defense in Depth. I'm David Spark, producer of the CISO series, and joining me, as always, as we host this show of a deep dive into one hot topic in security, is Alan Alford, the CISO of Mitel. Today's topic, should companies build an information security council? This is based on a post that you, Alan, put up on LinkedIn that got a lot of thoughtful responses. Explain what this is and and what we're going to be talking about today. All right. So the fundamental premise is we're talking about how to get the business to take stronger ownership and security practice. And one of the best ways I proposed to do that was to build a cybersecurity council with representation from all nooks and crannies of the business, at, at, preferably at high levels of the company. And uh, to have those folks make the key decisions, the the fundamental premise being that security is, after all, risk, and risk is something the business should be managing, not not one guy, no matter what his title is. And joining us in this conversation will be, he's right here, Nick Espinoza, host of nationally syndicated show The Deep Dive with Nick Espinoza, and his daily podcast is called Nick's Nerd News Daily. Very excited to have you on the show, Nick. Thank you for having me. Very much looking forward to this conversation. What's everybody talking about? So Dan Holden, the CEO of Pharos Security, thinks your idea, Alan, is excellent. Anything that assists pushing accountability past the CISO and helps to prevent the fall guy scenario is a good thing. Is that why you kind of asked this question or why you think there should be an information security council, Alan? Oh, I think it's much bigger than that. It's I think there's definitely an added benefit there. Certainly to say, you know, hey, when one guy's not the scapegoat, no matter who that role might be, I think there's a benefit there. But the reality is it's about, do you really want one person making such critical and such important business decisions, right? Even if they're very smart like yourself, right? Now, they can be as smart as they want. Do they really truly understand the business processes and priorities of every nook and cranny of that company? And do they have the wherewithal and the ability to actually measure the, the worth of one over the other, right? Because a lot of this has to do, when you talk about these kinds of things and, and risk and, and, and all this kind of assessment, you're talking about prioritization. Do you really want one guy whose job is security over here on the sidelines to be saying, uh, marketing is more important than sales this week, or, or that business process finance is doing is more important than that business process HR is doing. You really need the business to own this if it's going to be effective and it's going to be well aimed. And Nick, if there is an information security council, what knowledge now does the security team now have, but more importantly, others have about security in their environment? What is like the new knowledge that's being brought forward? Well, I mean, I think anything that that goes to speak to awareness is pretty much coming to the forefront these days. But I, I want to take it back for a second. And there's, sure. a, there's a quote that I absolutely love from this movie from years ago, where a losing team of a championship got interviewed and their captain said, well, it's a team effort. So it takes all of us working together to really screw this one up. And, you know, I think that when we are when we are talking about something like a security council for an organization, I think that everything that's been mentioned here is absolutely important in terms of that accountability, in terms of the visibility that that it should have to every nook and cranny of the organization. And if I'm coming back to your question for me, I think that, well, I think really what we need to be promoting is that awareness, not just of cybersecurity issues, but the overall vision of the company and where it's going and how security is actually securing it to ensure the success of the business as it's moving forward. We need buy-in from everybody. And I think a lot of times where, where I see CISOs and other security professionals fall down in their organizations is that they fail to really get across that message. Security is not there to annoy you. It's there to empower you to ensure that you can successfully do your job without fear of threat. And I think that's the big thing. You know, that leads me to my next question. And, and Dan Holden, again, he went on to say where the CISO should be accountable. And he said, quote, CISO should have a business level strategy for communicating and providing at what level they do or don't have protection from unacceptable business impacts. And this is where there's such a great need for two-way communications. I see he goes on to say, if the CISO can't define and repeatedly prove progress to that goal, then it's likely the CISO strategy will be challenged. I mean, 
Should that be pretty much the parameters of how a CISO should be rated, Alan? I think it's a darn good start. Quite honestly, if I if I don't have that strategic vision, if I can't speak to where security can, just, just like Nick said, I have to align with the business. I have to empower the business. I have to enable the business. I'm not an obstacle. I'm a business enabler. But to be a business enabler, I have to understand the business. I have to then be able to articulate to the business, what is that security strategy? What is that vision? And then like any good business practitioner, I got to be able to prove once I've come up with this vision and once I've come up with a roadmap and begun acting towards it, I have to be able to prove my progress against it. I can't just make up numbers and say, hey, we're looking pretty secure, right? I've got to have something meaningful and measurable to present. So I think Dan's absolutely right. And I'll ask you, Nick, do you think non-security divisions of a company even know the right questions to ask? I mean, is it may be up to the CISO and the security team to sort of guide them down those questions to be asking them. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's similar to the adage of, the, you know, the customer is always right. Well, most often the customer doesn't necessarily know what they need, <laughs> you know, and it's kind of our job to make sure that we're getting them there. But here's the problem I think that most CISOs have. It's hard for a CISO in an organization to say, the buck stops here, especially at the C level, because oftentimes they're taking direction from a CIO or a CFO or a CEO. And so if they are trying to push this out, it's their job, I think, to work to get the buy-in to leverage the C level of every aspect of an organization to make sure that every that every aspect of that organization is really on board for this. I think that's a huge, huge problem that we see at at the higher structural level, that the CISO is always kind of pigeonholed in a way when when the CISO should definitely be more empowered to, to speak to the masses. Is this problem solvable? I look at this effort as being analogous to trying to drive DevOps or even DevSecOps within your organization. Those companies who have achieved that are like ahead of the pack and others kind of become jealous. But getting there is a massive hurdle and there is never an end state. It's always a process. So Michael Ball, advisor with Freedom Mobile, had a recommendation tactic to getting everybody up to speak quickly. He said, develop the council as part of the breach readiness plan. Bring business, legal, privacy, HR, and corp communications to the council. Now, some of the people I noticed, Alan, in your in the discussion said that they did have an information security council going. Just having a group and talking about it is hard to get people excited about because they're so overwhelmed with their own jobs. But a breach readiness plan seems like a really good starting place. Did you start there or where did you start? So uh, I think breach readiness is a good one, but but I would argue that to a certain extent, breach readiness, e- even though it's about readiness and readiness by definition sounds like proactive, it, it is still to a certain sense a, a reactionary facet of the of the game. But it is a way of getting the groups together. That's more than what I'm it saying. is a way of getting the business aligned. But I think but I think something a little more proactive than that that's very similar but more strategic and that can involve more of the business is business continuity and disaster recovery. That's a fantastic starting point for the CSC because, you know, for the Cybersecurity Council or the Information Security Council, whatever you want to call them, if you can get business continuity and disaster recovery on the table, it's a more strategic take on that same breach response sort of mindset, but it involves everybody because every single business process, every nook and cranny of the business, there is a business process that that has value that needs to be addressed. And to tackle that and say, hey, let's talk about if the bad thing happens, how do we cope? And let's measure what our business processes are. Let's let's stack rank them. Let's figure out the ones that are most important to the business. And let's, as a team, tackle this problem. And breach readiness becomes a sort of almost an, an adjunct to that if you do it right. But but I, I agree with the sentiment for sure. What do you think is a good starting point, Nick? So I, I actually take a little different approach than Alan on this. And the way I have gotten organizations that I consult with into the fold is I start with risk tolerance. If we don't have a good understanding of risk tolerance, then building a good framework for infrastructure, contingency planning, cybersecurity, all of that can seriously falter. If we don't know, for example, at a basic level, how many computers can be out before everybody's screaming, you know, torches and pitchforks at the CEO's door or we're just out of business, then I find that a lot of times these things falter. And so when I am dealing with, let's say, a room full of C-level for an organization, that's where we start. And the conversation that comes up from that is, well, I can never be down or I can, you know, I can be down for a week or whatever that is. But if we have that buy-in and understanding from every aspect of the organization at that level, 
then we can build contingency planning or breach readiness or anything else. And everybody's going to be on the same page, understanding what their function is and what their uptime is in there. And so I, I with Alan, I mean, I, I agree, starting with something that is going to pull everybody together, which is some kind of disaster, is an excellent way to do this, because the goal here is to foster communication at its core. Now, I, I want to bring up something that Francisco, I hope I'm pronouncing his last name correctly, Cipollone, who, who is a cloud architect for Camelot, makes a good point about building up company awareness. He said, you can use the council to raise awareness in different organizational units, which is essentially what you guys have been talking about. And I want to play an audio clip from a listener, Shanna Gordon of Fish Labs, and she talks about how they gamify security training at their company. We do monthly micro learnings and simulations. And to make it fun, we give out little rubber fish as rewards. The employees love to collect the little fish and display them proudly on their desk in their cubicles. We also have contests surrounding our fishing and security simulations. Basically, we divide the company into teams, and whichever team gets the worst score that month, meaning the highest click rate on the Sims, has to bring in lunch for the team that scored the best. Reporting the fish is also a huge component of our training program, so that component is also rewarded. We feel it's extremely important to make it educational and enjoyable for your employees to be an effective program. Who's our sponsor this week? It's Fluency Security, and their central log management solution will take you down a simpler path to adhering to industry compliance and privacy regulations. There was this Forrester Wave Security Analytics Platforms Report Q3 2018, and Forrester states that current security analytics tools focus on threat detection, not compliance, and therefore companies, quote, will need a separate compliance solution. Fluency Security works as a SIM tool or with your existing SIM solution to help meet both industry and privacy regulations related to log management. Fluency's integration with your existing SIM avoids the rip and replace and adds strength, capacity, and scalability with their unique correlation and risk scoring technologies. The more data you have, the better, as their AI and machine learning quickly learns your environment and provides comprehensive real-time identification of threat anomalies. To learn more, well, you got to go visit FluencySecurity.com. I bet you could figure that one out by yourself. Or stop by their booth. I'm sure you're going to remember this number, 4529 at the RSA conference in March. Does it play nicely with others? What are the problems you continue to face if you don't create a council like this, Alan? So it ties into what Shanna said. If you don't have a council like this and you're attempting to get business buy-in, then you better be pulling out every single other tool you've got in your toolkit to try to get the business involved, right? And get them engaged. So things like the gamification, having the anti-phishing training, security awareness training, meeting with departments one-on-one. Uh, there's a million and one smaller scale, more tactical, less impactful strategies that you can do. If you don't tie this all up at the top and put a comprehensive council together at the top, I really think you're you're risking not having the reach you need, not having the clout security needs throughout the business. And and more importantly, you're going to be running yourself ragged trying to pick these things up in little one-off encounters. It strikes me that you really have to do this at the top, as, as well as those other efforts. Don't get me wrong. Those other efforts are still required. I just think that they're an adjunct to having this council as opposed to the other way around. You know, in general, when teams do cross-function, it, it improves business overall. We all see this rather when they're operating in silos. And this is, by the way, not isolated to trying to get security involved. Other departments just start working together in general. But everyone is always overwhelmed with their own jobs. They don't want to take on additional responsibility. Nick, what are the techniques to use in this council to actually make people's jobs easier? Is there anything a council like this could eliminate or facilitate? Yeah, well, let's look at the situation like a major data breach that happened a couple of years ago that dumped hundreds of millions of records of all of us out there. Basically, that is the perfect example of where not having a team with cross-functional capability really hurts an organization. So for the breach I'm thinking of, and I'm not going to name names here, but they basically came out and said one guy was supposed to patch the infrastructure and he was essentially unavailable. And so here we are, completely blew up. In this sense, 
like a team both eliminates the worry and facilitates redundancy for critical functionality, such as patching and other major organizational issues. Like in this sense, we promote the buy-in to the system and the solution for the future business. So a lot of people, I don't think necessarily understand like hierarchy in the sense that like it's the CEO that's going to have the vision. It's the CFO that's going to fund it. It's the CIO that's going to build the infrastructure to run it. And it's the CISO that secures it. And in this case, I'm looking at the council to enforce it across the organization. And so if you've got people in terms of, let's say, a technique, specifically a leadership technique, what we are looking for is the buy-in, I think, of the entire organization. So they are continuing to, if, we, if we, they understand that they are contributing to like a greater good, they're buying into that vision. And that's when we get people on board. So what I think is, it's more in the abstract, just in terms of my thought process of what this can do. But in terms of minutia, I think there's a lot of different things that it, it can do. And it's pretty much to everything that, that Alan just mentioned in terms of all these little smaller projects that we can have in terms of like gamification for breach testing and, and all that kind of stuff. But, but in the end, I think that is our, is our biggest issue. We have to get the buy-in for this technique. And I think the, a council like this definitely eliminates and facilitates that literally at the exact same time. So anything to add to that, Alan? And I think for what you said earlier, a council like this would eliminate, you know, an overload of security training. Yes. Yeah. I, I think you still have to have your security training. I mean, you still have to reach everybody in the business, right? But at the end of the day, this council, just like Nick said, this, this council is there to, to clarify and solidify and deliver the proper security messaging uh, in such a way that all, all players are participants and not just recipients, right? The training has to be there too. You, you never get away from that. But, but I think the council's core purpose is just like Nick described. Now, Christoph Foulon, uh, InfoSec Manager at Avenade, summarized why he liked this idea. He said, it's a great way to truly embed security into the culture of the business, just like what you guys were saying. He went on to say, having business input in security and risk issues allows them to better accept risks or help reduce implementation friction of new solutions or process changes. And I think that very last part is, I think, probably the critical thing, because correct me if I'm wrong, Ellen, you, whenever you're trying to implement something that's a, a new security implementation, you must often deal with friction or, you know, blockers or whatever that to prevent you or just slow down your process. Is that the case usually? Absolutely. Any any good CISO who's a veteran, any CISO who's been through the through through the ringer one more than once, will tell you that the number one battle is never technical. The number one battle is always cultural. You're representing significant and sometimes significant, other times not so impactful, but still but still change, right? You're you're coming in and saying, hey, you who've always done this one thing this one way with this one HR system, I, I need you to do something differently now in the name of security. You over here in finance, you've always emailed this certain way, and I need you to email a certain different way because security, because security, because security is is a, is a, is a mantra that's not going to always fly. You have to be prepared for their perceptions. It's a cultural dialogue. It's a change dialogue. It's a process of change, and and that takes both parties talking together and coming together. There will be friction if you don't grease the skids, right? And and this council certainly helps to to take a good step that direction. Hey, Nick, do you think that security needs like its own PR team internally or or there should be maybe like a culture manager within security to kind of go to do the rah, rah for security? Because in general, most companies, security has got a kind of a bad name. Yes. And I, you know, that, that's funny because I, I completely agree with that. And I do think that there has to be an understanding of culture. I think, though, that because we are essentially living in the age of the data breach, I think people are aware. And one of the problems that we have is that people get into the mindset of, well, it's going to happen to everybody. So, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to worry about it and all that. When, when the answer should, to that should be, no, we all have to help each other. And I think that if we are really looking for an answer, and this is actually what I tell audiences like when I'm speaking on stage, is that we can actually look at immunobiology for the right message to deliver to our people. Now, there's a concept in immunobiology called herd immunity. And think about this for a moment. If we're if there's a hundred of us sitting out there and the only people we interact with for the most part is ourselves, and 99 of us have, let's say, the measles vaccine, but I don't, the odds of me getting measles are significantly less because I'm surrounded by people that are vaccinated. And so if I'm approaching an organization, I'm thinking if everybody is aware of technology, then they're not going to get hacked, which ensures I'm not going to get hacked through them. 
And if we have this awareness, if we are able to spread this pervasive message across every nook and cranny of an organization, as Alan says, then I think we're that much better. And the person to drive that home is going to be essentially the cheerleader, the PR manager, the, the cultural manager, whatever you want to call that person that fits the culture. I think that's important. And one other thing I will say about this as well is that a lot of organizations don't have cultures where employees, when they make a mistake, feel okay to speak up. And the problem that we see in cybersecurity a lot of times is that people see this and it is so important that we know ASAP when something is going wrong. This is how we help to prevent the spread of infections, for example. But the culture has historically dictated, if I say something, I'm in trouble. And now you've got a CISO getting up there, sending out emails and messages and notices and all this saying, if you see something wrong, please let us know ASAP. But the culture is literally the antithesis of that. And that, I think, is something that we have to get the message out on and really combat that. That is an awesome, awesome point, Nick. I love that. And I want to actually quote something that Sam Horton, account exec in Armor Cloud Security, said that supports just what you said. And, and yeah, I think we'll close out our discussion here. Not only does having this Information Security Council increase security awareness across the business, what we've been discussing, it also gives people an ownership stake in the security of the company. This should lead to fewer human errors. I mean, because we realize that's where a lot of the problems happen, as we discussed in a uh, previous episode, Alan, or actually it's going it to might be a later episode, depending on when we release it. it. This should lead to fewer human errors or lack of caring, which is causing breaches and compromises. Nick, I want to thank you so much for being on this episode of the podcast. You, Your wisdom and intelligence on this and your experience has really brought a lot to the show. Thank you so much. Uh, before I let you speak, I'm going to let Alan compliment you as well. I, I You got to agree with me. Yes, Alan? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolute agreement. This was fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on. I love the energy. I love the thinking. Fantastic show. And thank you guys. Thank you. I, I've had so much fun. I love, I could, you have three more hours. I could keep going. This is the thing that we come to on at the end of every show. We say, we try to keep the show short, but we could have easily talked about this for another three hours. No problem. Nick, would you like to plug your podcast where people can find them? By all means, by all means. And thank you for the opportunity. So you can find me on Facebook and Twitter slash Nick AESP or at Nick AESP, LinkedIn slash Nick Espinoza, YouTube slash Nick Espinoza, SoundCloud slash Nick AESP. You really can't not get a hold of me <laughs> or find me, but I do daily videos and audio and I'm always looking for feedback, good or bad. And uh, guys, thanks again for having me. I, I will say, Nick, by the way, send me the links to all of that. So I'll make sure that all of that appears in the blog post. And everybody, the reason Nick is on the show is because I watched one of his videos and he said, this guy is awesome on the microphone. He's got to be on our show. And you proved it. Thank you again, Nick. And I want to thank our listeners as well. By the way, we we are always looking for your input. So whenever Alan comments on something or if you see a really hot discussion out there, that's our big thing. Every episode is a based on a hot discussion. If you see something hot out there that's getting a lot of engagement, getting a lot of conversation, please let me know about it. Just go to CISOseries.com. There's contact right there. And then also make sure that you're following Alan and I on um, LinkedIn because we will post things requesting your input and you record audio clips to send into the show. Thank you again for listening to this episode of Defense in Depth. We've reached the end of Defense in Depth. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss yet another hot topic in cybersecurity. This show thrives on your contributions. Please write a review, leave a comment on LinkedIn or on our site, CISOseries.com, where you'll also see plenty of ways to participate, including recording a question or a comment for the show. If you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, contact David Spark directly at David at CISOseries.com. Thank you for listening to Defense In Depth.